We're heading south for some crime at the 4.30 movie, and the woman of the hour has found an apprentice in a wild robot. I'm Van Connor. And I'm Adam Ball, and this is Off Screen, your seven-day guide to everything movies. Boom. Groovy. Hello and welcome back to Off Screen. It is another week and another set of movies to look at that Van has obviously managed to watch before I do because that's why he's the one that talks about them. So, um, loads today, actually. We've got the 430 movie. We've got the uh, Apprentice, the one that a lot of people are talking about uh, at the moment. I think Donald Trump tweeted something about it, saying that it was lies and it wasn't true and he's actually taking someone to court. I think the, the producers or the director, he's taken to court because of... Uh, he's trying, he's trying yeah, yeah, he's not actually filed anything yeah. he claims he has he's not actually filed anything it's a weird story it's all it's all so bluster well that probably means that there's stuff in the movie mm. that makes him not look so great so we'll find out because we'll talk to van about that in a moment uh, the wild robot on the way but let's start first with something to tickle your musical taste buds um this is head south um and i'll hand over to you now van because all i know is it's about the underground post-punk music scene yeah you're gonna you'd love this you're gonna absolutely love this Mr. Ball. We are, starting, we are starting this week firmly on your foot with this one. So, uh, written and directed by uh, Jonathan Ogilvy. Uh, this is, and it feels like it's kind of a semi-autobiographical thing. It has the feel of that, and I, I will get to why in a negative way quite later on. Um, but it's set in 1979 New Zealand and is about Angus, a, sort of a teenage boy, like a schoolboy, played by Ed Oxenbold from Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No, no Good, Very Bad Day. Uh, and Better Watch Out, and movies like that, who I've, I've always quite enjoyed. He's always been quite a fun screen presence as he's been growing up. And uh, he is uh, a teenage boy who discovers punk music. And it starts him on this coming-of-age journey as he sort of navigates his relationships, his nav- relationships with people at school, as he finds his first love interest, his first sort of forays into self-exploration through the punk music scene and his, his sort of lusting for the first, you know, teen relationship, that kind of thing. Um, all played, as I say, against the backdrop of 1979 New Zealand punk. So, have a listen. Uh, this is Head South. Play guitar? I'm learning. What? What the bloody hell are you doing? Are those my wedding shoes? Yeah, you never wear them. Are you starting your back? Yeah. You can't play anything. I've got a song, Boxton. Boxton, Boxton, Boxton. What? Nothing. You'd be surprised how often it happens in life, confusing the magnetic with the truth. Regret the things you have done. And the things you haven't done. So, was the Antipodean punk scene uh, any different to the punk scene over here? It's pretty much just the standard 70s punk scene as depicted via cinema, really. Um, I will say that 95% of this is a great movie. It's 95 of this, 95%, honestly, it's great. Pretty much the first 95% as well. And then the final 5%, which is literally the ending of it. It's like, why have you done that? Like, what a random thing to have done. Like, this makes no sense. Like, as far as the character arc goes, the narrative arc, the, the thematic arc. Like, what? why have you done this? And it's only because the rest of it has felt like it's been so personal. It's had these weird little asides. You think, this has to have happened to someone because it's otherwise such a strange little inclusion that you then think, oh, okay, I wouldn't want to look too deeply into this because presumably this is a personal thing that the, the author of the piece has, you know, felt obligated to include. In which case, okay, I understand that. But from our perspective, from the outside, you just like... You've chosen to end this on an ungodly downbeat that just makes no sense. It's jarring, and it takes you out of a movie that otherwise, like I say, was great. It's like a cross between Sing Street and Risky Business with Ed Oxenbold, who's still very, very sort of charismatic and goofy. He's always good fun, Ed Oxenbold. Um, Paper Planes with, um, uh, what's his name, Sam... Worthington, Sam Worthington did a few years ago as well. He was great in that as well. It's a child actor who's just sort of come up in the last decade. Um, 
I really enjoyed it. Plus, you know the rule. If the movie's got Martin Sokas in, it gets an extra star anyway. I mean, I'd give this four stars, despite the fact that it has an absolutely crap ending that just undercuts the entire rest of it. But other than that, four stars. See it? Just, just I don't know, stop watching it 90 seconds before the end. <laughs> I don't care about it. <laughs> There you go. If you do want to go and see it, go and watch it, but don't watch the end. Watch Head the end. south yeah. in cinemas. Yeah, it's just don't watch the end. Walk out the cinema before it finishes and you'll leave happy wanting more. Um, and it is in cinemas from today. Uh, right, let's move swiftly on to our next movie, which is Woman of the Hour. Um, uh, it's a true crime, I believe, this one, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know the, sto- the story of the dating game killer? Do you know this story? No, no. This is one of those that's... It's sort of moderately quite famous, this story. Um, In the US, you know the dating game, their version of Blind Date? In 1979, a uh, a serial killer found his way onto the dating game as one of the three male contestants, and he won. Oh. That's the that's the famous story, okay? And and it was then discovered that he actually was this the serial killer who, you know, not only had been sort of interrogated by police, but had been you know incarcerated, he'd been locked up for manslaughter and everything, and it just had been overlooked by the show's producers. And this is the story, a non-linear take on that story that stars Anna Kendrick as really the really the POV character um, who is the female contestant on the show that night the female contestant who had was put opposite the three bachelors you know of which one was the notorious uh, uh, I think his name is Rodney Rodney Alcala was the name of the uh, the killer um so she's played by Anna Kendrick who has also made her directorial debut uh, with this film as well so it's set in 1979 and takes place around the day game say but it's non-linear as well so it also includes other chapters in the life and exploits of alcala and his killing spree over the years have a listen i've been on this show since 1968 but one thing i've learned is no matter what words they use the question beneath the question remains the same what's the question which one of you will hurt me? And bachelor number three, I'm counting on you. What are girls for? Oh, is that the end? <laughs> I thought it was going on to something else. I was sat there thinking, oh, what's next? Oh, it was, is, is this a moment when someone's been killed? Like, what's going on? Yeah, it's gone silent. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> So, um, as far as Anna Kendrick's first directorial role, like, how does she do? Very well, actually. She makes some interesting choices. There's some stylistic and tonal choices that she makes that I, I, I thought were quite compelling. There was some really interesting use of the, the visual landscape, how things are staged and how things have been sort of arranged and, 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 and realised for the screen. Because it, it manages to... That's really the thing that I think. that That and the performances are what keep it above feeling like kind of a schlocky made for... Instantly made for streaming on the cheap dramatisation, really. Like a something that would star soap actors, you know, no-name actors, and just be about some forgotten killing, you know, killer event. Um it's the, it's mm. the it's the pedigree of the direction that that gives it that leg up, and then it's the performances that take it the rest of the way there. Kenna, uh, Kendrick in the lead, I said Kenna, Anna Kendrick in the lead. I think is she's brilliant. She's on standard form, really. She's not required to do much more than we've ever seen her do. This this feels about on par with her role in um, A Simple Favor from 2017, the Paul Feig thriller A Simple Favor. This feels about as much of a sort of flex of her dramatic muscles really as that um obviously it requires yeah it's, it's not a role that requires physicality for instance like the accountant um daniel zavato i didn't know uh from anything else i didn't recognize him from anything else but he makes quite an impression as rodney arcala it's a really creepy performance but you can sort of understand how 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 the, the the guy would have functioned in the real world based on this performance now i had heard the story i had not seen any of the real story before watching the movie i did actually watch a couple of youtube sort of you know retrospectives about the real you know thing including the actual broadcast by the way the original broadcast is on youtube oh i I have watched some of it the casting for uh for alcala daniel zavato is actually pretty perfect not so much physically there's a certain physicality to him that he that he gets but it's the it's the charisma and the charm 
that he, he displays. There's a sort of Ricardo Montalban quality to the real Rodney Alcala that Daniel Zavato seems to know to tap into. He seems to see that himself. And he seems to be, do you know what? Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'm going I'm to find my inner Ricardo Montalban as well, just like that dude was. Rather than just impersonate Rodney Alcala, he seems to have just gone back to the source material. And it works very well, to be fair. It, if it has a flaw, and it does, it's that the focus is a little bit too all over the place. But you do feel like that has been done to pad it out. It's not an overly especially long film. It weighs in at 95 minutes, but it does feel like it's been padded. Like this feels like there's... It's, I mean, it's a film where, for instance, the dating game element of it unfolds in more or less real time. So it is a film that is you know, rather bloated and, and padded out in that way. Uh, and I felt like that was a bit of a shame really, because the story was interesting. The performances are great. Like I say, we made a fantastic directorial debut uh, for Anna Kendrick. But you know what? He's on Netflix anyway, so it's not like it's going to be a, uh, a waste of cash over the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, this is up my street because it's, it's true crime, mm. essentially, and you know what I'm like. I'll, I'll dive into anything oh, that's a true story when it's something like this. But, but uh, yeah, maybe that'll be on my list for the weekend. Woman of the Hour, you can stream it now on Netflix. You don't have to leave the house. Uh, stay where you are. We've got the 4.30 movie coming up, and The Crime Is Mine. We'll see what Van thought of that next, all right? Stay there. Hello and welcome back to Off Screen. We have got a load more movies to talk about now. Uh, the 4.30 movie in a sec, but let's go back to The Crime Is Mine. I'll be completely honest with you, hands up. Um, as soon as I read Paris, France, I thought, no, this is dubbed. I'm not going to carry on. Well, I mean, it's it's an adaptation of a, a stage play. It's been brought to the screen and uh, uh, adapted by and directed by uh, Francois Ozon. Uh, director who has you know brought us actually some quite decent films over the years. Everything was fi- everything went fine, uh, being one of them. Uh, France Swimming Pool uh, was one of his, and uh, a, a movie near and dear to our hearts, <clears throat> of course, from two years ago because we had great fun uh, pronouncing its title uh, on a whim, mm-hmm. uh, which was of course the uh, the now iconic Peter von Kant, K A N T Kant. Uh, which we, uh, which we uh, was was a horrible, horrible uh, title to have to say over and over uh, when you were reviewing it. If you remember, why well, I've spared you the agony. Yeah, because it makes them. you sound it makes you sound like a Cockney Londoner. It makes you sound like you're being Ray Winston, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, if you it pretend does. you're Ray Winston and you say that name. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> new ones. This is set in I think 1930s uh, Paris. Um, it, it's uh, say it's called Mon Crime in its its original time rather than the crime as much. It's just it's uh, Mon crime. Um, it is about a struggling actress who is accused of the murder of a, you know, a, a big, a rich big wig producer uh, who's running a stage show. She's accused of his murder and with her friend uses the uh, the trial uh, as a sort of a feminist argument. She sort of gets away with murder based on a feminist argument and finds her career on the rise as, as she becomes sort of a, a cult figure, a, a populist you know, news figure because of it, like an it girl a celebrity an influence an it girl of the moment if you will but this of course brings other elements out of woodwork that threaten to unravel uh, her web of lies um it's actually it's, it's quite good fun it's it's quite breezy and sort of whimsical you can very clearly tell that it has come from a stage play because one of those things that's been designed and blocked and and clearly instructed to perform you know, in, in a certain way. Like, it, it, this has clearly been done as we, we are doing an adaptation of a stage play rather than we are making a film. You, you know what I mean? Like, this is not the cinematic adaptation of the story. This is just we are adapting the, the, the play for the film. You know, we are performing the play for the film. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can kind of tell that from the trailer. It's very, it, yeah. I kind of, it's, it's not, it's not actually correct, mm. but it gives me a feeling of two dimensional. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's. Do you remember when we had Beetlejuice recently? We had the Beetlejuice sequel, and I said to you, it had lost that flat two D plywood quality that yes. made the first Beetlejuice so much fun. It's, it's, it's kind of the reverse of that in a way that it's like they've intentionally put that in. It's the kind of thing you wish they'd done in Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, but they kind of kept the the, the fun naffness of it in a way. Um, but yes, that state craft production, you know what I mean, where it's an obvious stage set kind of a thing. Um, a a theatre set, let's, let's say, rather than a stage set. Um, yeah. But yes, and it's, it's very much that vibe. And it's like, good, good fun. Um, 
not really a, 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 a dull note to be had. Are you, uh, it's a, the Martin Sokus rule applies here. The second Isabel Huppert turns up in anything, uh, I have to give it an extra star, just because Isabel Huppert is just one of those people who's just so much fun. Every time they turn up in a movie, no matter what the movie is, you know Isabel Huppert is going to be like down to clown. She's going to be having a ball. This is very much another example of that uh, with her. And uh, and so you've got a pair of quite compelling leads as well. Sorry, I've turned my uh, IMDb over uh, to my actual notes. Uh, Nadia uh, Tereskovic, um, who actually plays Madeline, the, uh, the, ad, the actress who's accused of everything. Um, she's essentially 50% of the uh, sort of POV narrative of this. Um, is, is quite solid. The, she kind of, I think she gets the, uh, the slightly more withdrawn of the two characters and it sort of falls to uh, Rebecca Marde, um as the, as the lawyer, the best friend, the lawyer character to really sort of get the heart and humanity of it. Beyond that, though, there are elements in there, some sort of classic kind of, I want to say, dark-hearted screwball antics of something like Death Becomes Her, if you can imagine that. But, Ooh, this, but, without, but, without, that. The, but without anywhere near the supernatural elements or anything like that. This is just more of a madcap, you know, getting away with murder type screwball romp. Well, uh, you can make your own mind up and see what you think. The Crime Is Mine is out in cinemas from today. Um, Okay, let's move on to the 4.30 movie. I know you're quite excited to talk about this one, Van. Well, I'm excited to talk about any Kevin Smith movie ever, to be honest. You know, well, I'm, I'm yeah. a big, I'm a, I'm a very big Kevin Smith fan. I have been. This is me. With, I'm, I'm going to admit this right off the top. This is my my sort of you know disclaimer at the top. I am like I'm a lifelong Kevin Smith fan, even though I, I will admit he's he sort of fallen off for me. Um, maybe let's say the last ten years. Not it's not quite been the same, and I think it's it's gotten a bit past the point of indulgence. For, for my taste, but that's that's me personally. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, so he is now back with uh, the 430 movie, a self-contained, completely isolated movie. This has nothing to do with the Viewersk universe or anything like that, that takes place in, I think, 1986 and centers around uh, Brian David, a, I think he's 16-year-old boy, who simply wants to ask out the girl that he fancies from school, who he had a bit of a thing with the previous summer, and he wants to try and get his shot with, you know, before they all, you know, go to senior year or go to the prom or whatever it is. He just wants to make a shot with uh, going to, you know, on that, at that that weekly pilgrimage for teenagers of that era, which was, of course, going to the 4.30 movie in the afternoon screening. But And uh, he and his two friends go along. It is the sort of group teen hang, after all, and each gets into their own set of, you know, screwball antics, their own sort of separate subplots that all intersect and see them in their various individual personal crises. Like one gets evicted from the cinema, one can't get into the right screen, etc., etc. I've got a clip for you. This should uh, this should set the tone for you. This is say Kevin Smith, mid eighties, the four thirty movie. This is, this is so cool. I, I've never met anyone who wanted to be a director before. Sure, you have. Just look in the mirror. Me? A, a director? Nah. I just, I just love going to the movies. Yeah, man. That's how it starts. Most people come to movies to escape their lives, but people like us, we come here because movies make life make sense. Out here, man, the world's full of lies. But in there, they tell the lie that tells the truth. And the truth about you and me is we're filmmakers. We just haven't made our films. One thing I have noticed about this movie is all the teenage boys uh-huh. look like middle-aged men dressed as teenagers. Yes, I think that's just because everyone just inherently looked older in the 80s. I think it's that old excuse. <laughs> um, it's a strange little film in a way. It does feel like... I mean, on the academic Kevin Smith fan level, I can look at this and quite clearly tell that this is Smith's... Even It might be unintended, but it certainly comes across that way. Um Smith's ode to the John Hughes movie, something like the Hangout movies of the mid '80s, something like the Breakfast Club, or something like that, but a Smithian take, you know, more of a Kevin, you know, Kevin Smith inspired, you know, his very particular brand of comedy take. Um, so, as such, it plays more to his his schmaltzier sensibilities. And Smith is not a writer for whom that has ever particularly been a success. Uh, I know that it's had something of a revision in recent years, but uh, uh, a Jersey Girl, for instance, still doesn't work 
uh, and you know something like Tusk, for instance. He, his films outside of the comedies just simply don't work for me because. Kevin Smith's ability to deliver sentiment and heart and feel good coming of age kind of stuff only seems to have any real success when it is combined with his darker hearted, R rated, nastier D and F jokes, if you know the term sensibilities. When you mash those two together, then you get good Kevin Smith. Outside of that, the results don't seem to work for me. I mean, he managed to make dogma work by simply infusing it with that, but the problem is he's not afford to do that here because he is dealing with younger teenagers and he's trying to make it a bit more of a say like a John Hughes type movie and it doesn't quite come together for that reason that said there's some decent little flourishes like the choice to use the heavy 80s soft focus you know the soft focus camera uh, lens trick and all that stuff I mean using Genesis Rodriguez there's a murderous row of cameos in there that go alongside her. I mean, you get people like Justin Long turning up, Jason Biggs, James Vanderbeek, people like that all, all, all appearing in there. Ken Jong gets the kind of, uh, uh, oh God, what was his name? From uh, the, the dad from Beetlejuice, who we now can't speak his name anymore because of reasons. Um, he gets that sort of token role as Ken Jong. It's a good old fashioned one, but it's just one that feels particularly hollow because it, 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 when it's, it's falling back on smith's standard for sentiment writing which ultimately feels very plastic very forced everybody speaks entirely in monologues and it it just can't really survive that and have quite a pedestrian sense of direction which is frankly the kevin smith standard the problem is that the kevin smith standard is only passable when in in execution when it is combined with his better writing and his better writing i'm sorry at this stage we all have to just admit only comes out when he is doing his for the boys you know snoochie boochie stuff well if you want to go watch it you can because the 430 movie is out in cinemas from today uh, okay still to come we're going to look at the wild robot in a little bit but next we're going to look at the apprentice stay where you are So, hello and welcome back to Off Screen. We are going to dive straight into our next movie, and that is the one I've been looking forward to all week. The, in fact, more than a week, probably two weeks. The Apprentice, of course. If you don't know anything about The Apprentice, it's all about Donald Trump and how he started his real estate business all the way back in the 70s. Um, does it go from then to now, or is it just like a... a- or portion of his life. No, no, it really only covers a few years. So it covers, I, I think it might be six or seven years. It's whenever Roy Cohn died. It literally covers the time that Trump met Roy Cohn in about 1979, I think, until Roy Cohn's death in the 80s, because the movie focuses on the relationship between you know, the young upstart Trump who really sort of lacks confidence. He hasn't really made much of a name for himself beyond being just Fred Trump's kid. And his journey from that into becoming the man that we know Donald Trump became in the mid-80s, when he became rock star Donald Trump, you know, in, in on, on the sort of the New York ce- celeb scene. Um, but it's about how that all came about through his relationship with Cohn and the role that Cohn had in literally crafting this person out of his, say it with the title, Apprentice. So I've got a clip for you. This is the pair um, in a tailor's. This is Roy Cohn literally, um, you know, taking Trump for his first first suit note that it's a brioni suit because to this day trump endlessly touts brioni suits and this is an era in which we're talking about you know a time in which trump literally can't afford you know an 1100 dollars suit you know this is like the 80s so it'd be like a three thousand dollar suit today so have a listen my dad is tough boy he's very tough well that's why you got to spread the news like it's already happening no we just you can't push him around very easily fine then. okay fine then uh what let him push you around is that what you want no i don't very very fine fabric brioni what is that merino wool <sighs> looks expensive how much is this one a thousand one hundred okay that's okay we'll take it and uh, uh matching shirt and tie i, I can't pay for forget this. it okay forget it listen here let's see oh I don't need your money. You'll pay me back uh, with your friendship, okay? Quid pro quo. Uh, you'll be a friend to me. I'll be a friend to you. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the pact, okay? If you look like a million bucks, I look like a million bucks. 
What's interesting about this is obviously Donald Trump managed to trump his dad essentially by becoming president. Yeah. Like he did more than his dad ever managed to do, although his dad was obviously very successful. I feel a bit sorry for Baron Trump because what on earth can Baron Trump do to trump his dad? I, I don't even I don't even want to begin to imagine because he does seem to be following. <laughs> but anyway, let's let's not go let's not go into there just yet. So um, this film is terrific. Uh, I, I was shocked by it. I took my mate Will to uh, the screen. We went to the first screening in the UK for this, uh, just just by dumb luck. I just happened, they just happened to have seats. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll come to that. And then and then they got the wrong screening room. We went to the, we had to slap across London. It was a hell of a time. We were expecting this to be kind of a parody, and no, no, it really wasn't. It was quite quite a, a, a compelling drama. Uh, the performances are great. Like Sebastian Stan gives good Trump. He's not doing an impersonation so much as he's doing an interpretation of Trump. He is doing his interpretation of how he imagines um, the, 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 the completely insecure side of the man to be. And how and how he grapples with you know the mask, which is to and you know in a way that downplays it as much as possible. I think it's quite an interesting performance. And then put opposite Jeremy Strong. I mean, uh, how do you even go with that? Jeremy Strong is great here. He's, he's fantastic as Roy Cohn. Uh, Maria Bakalova as well from the Borat sequel as uh, Ivanka Trump uh, also gets to. I mean, she deals with some harrowing material here. It has to be said. And when we talk about the materials, well, incidentally, this is a film. That's not afraid to go there as far as the darker elements of its subject material, you know, go. There's a reason that this film has had cease and desist letters, you know, or, you know, cease and desist letters, I think, is as far as they've gone. The Trump campaign has taken no actual official legal action against the film. They have simply claimed that they have and threatened to, I believe. But there's been nothing actually done about it, I don't think. Is there anything in particular from seeing it that you think mm. Donald <clears throat> wouldn't like? Oh, a lot. Oh, tons. <laughs> tons and tons. Oh, God. Put it this way, it's going to be a fascinating movie if Trump... If, if Trump gets re-elected, I, I don't know how this movie's going to play. Because it's just going to be like, okay, how do, you, how do you have this in existence and the guy's president at the same time? It's a movie that only plays if he's a one-term president. If he becomes a, a, a two-term president, then all bets are off. Um, but I really liked it. I, I, I honestly, we were shocked by just how riveting it was, and I knew a fair amount of the story. I, I've seen enough in the way of like you know profile pieces on Trump or like you know exposés and you know uh, profile segments on things like Last Week Tonight, where they've gone back and given you like the the forgotten bits of the story. And and he is a fascinating man in that regard. The film I thought found interesting areas. In even what even within what I knew, to actually mine interesting drama from, particularly in the relationship between Trump and you know his late father Fred, who's played for here by Martin Donovan. Uh, Martin Donovan, you know, starred in in. Believe it or not, I think he's in the very first episode of Angel. I think he's the bad guy that Angel kicks out of a window in the very first episode. 25 years ago this year, true story. 25 wow. years ago this month, I believe. True story. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's that's a fascinating relationship to see laid out, and the way that they depict Trump in his uh, in his relationship with Cohn, I think would feel quite uncomfortable, given how raw it seems to be played. I would imagine that would, that might make you feel a bit uncomfortable if it was you that you know was part of that dynamic. That's all I'm going to say, because, I mean, he did the man dirty, but he did, you know, in that way that Trump, to our knowledge, historically has done a lot of people dirty. You know, it, it, it's sort of a known quantity about Donald Trump as a man that he's not especially loyal, Dis, you know, despite how much he touts, you know, the need for loyalty, he is not an especially loyal man. And we kind of see that within this movie. We see that as one of many things that, you know, we see the origin of. There are a lot of elements of Donald Trump, the man, even down to like in our clip, for instance, when they, you know, he says, like, oh, this is a Brioni suit and oh, I will treat you to this. You know, this is, and this is the standard I need you to live up to. 
and you see the origins of all the individual components that come together to make Trump the man. His weight, his hair, the makeup that he wears, everything that... It's, it's quite subtly done in some cases, and then there are other cases in which it's sort of it's it's actually you know taken as quite an integral part of the building of the man. It's an interesting combination. It never feels too particularly too heavy handed, and it's you know it's a film that you do actually find yourself quite invested in the personal drama of, despite knowing the outcome in advance. Anything bad that you'd say about it? Anything bad I would say about it? No, I mean just that I just that I saw this about a month ago, and I really wish I had like a link or something for it that I could watch it again because I've really been looking forward. <laughs> to it. I really enjoyed it. I really, honestly, I was really. Looking I wish to you it. had the link as well. It felt very. Do you know? It's kind of got the style. It's kind of got the style of something like The Big Short, or a bit like Wall Street, or something like that. But you know, but it's but it's Trump. You know, it it does feel like it belongs to that very much uh, that, that pantheon of great, you know, Wall Street finance type tycoon movies. You know, that gave us so many great like Michael Douglas performances and things like that. I, I genuinely think Sebastian Stan is terrific in it. Um, it's it's my favorite of the two movies he's in this month. I mean, the other one being A Different Man. And yeah, I just. I, I, nothing but good things to say about it, really. I really, really enjoyed The Apprentice. Like I say, we were expecting it to be a parody. Mm. And it's not. And it's not an impersonation either, but it's every bit the scathing indictment that it needs to be. It's the character profile piece that said, look, this is the villainy that the man, you know, as far as we are led to believe, historically has committed. You know, cold light of day. Here's how it plays out. And in some cases, that's, you know, it's material that you, you have to imagine they questioned whether or not they should. But for the, you know, the importance of, you know, narrative sincerity, they have. And I think it's worth seeing, to be honest. Blimey, it's been a, quite a while since you've ra- rated a movie without any negative points whatsoever. So it's got to be good. It's got to be good. <laughs> um... Uh, ooh, I don't know. No, no I, I really can't think of anything. I really can't think of any, any, any. Even like down to the makeup and things. Like you'd expect the makeup would get a bit silly, but it doesn't. You, you never feel that the makeup effects or the because he put some weight on. I think he put like thirty five pounds on or something. Mm. But I, there's still some makeup compositing on there and there. I would have. I would have thought they would feel a bit goofier than it does. But it doesn't. It never actually feels goofy, and you would expect that it would, given that you know. It's so easy to slip into cartoonishness when it's Donald Trump. And to be to their absolute credit, they managed to make quite a compelling, serious, like grown-up drama out of it. Well, The Apprentice is out in cinemas from today. One last ride to go, then. We're going to look at the Wild Robot animated movie in just a minute. Stay where you are. Hello and welcome back to Offscreen for one last ride this week and we are going to dive in to the wild robot right now. Um, So this is animated. Um, I don't know a huge amount about it apart from it's a cute little robot really. I'd be honest with you, Adam, I, I half assumed, actually, that given Albert's age, that you actually might be familiar with this. Because it's a basically, it's an adaptation of a best-selling children's book. Like a, a best-selling sort of I think large print and illustrated children's book. Oh. And what they've done is, sort of ad- in the same way that DreamWorks adapted the Bad Guys series uh, to the screen a couple of years ago, they've adapted this as well. Uh, so, so, adaptation of you know, children's book, uh, brought to the screen by Chris Sanders. So it's directed by Sanders. He's also co-written it with uh, Peter Brown. And it's it's the story of Rosam7163, I think she's called, a, a Rosam robot, a robot helper, who's designed for a sort of Jetsons-like civilization, you know, civilization, like a Jetsons-like iteration of the human race at some point in our future um yeah as the sort of robot housekeeper fulfilling any task she washes up on a remote island after a storm one the only surviving one of a number of sort of broken robots in the water she she arrives on her own (laughs) finds her way to safety the only other you know life on the island is animal life which of course she can't communicate with however being a robot she can simply put herself into learning mode and then faster than you can say the hunt for red october they can talk or at least they to her and that's how we see the movie 
played out. So Roz, as she starts to become known, tries to find tasks to fulfill from the local wildlife who now can communicate with her. And when she is mistakenly attacked by a bear, she finds herself um, the the only the sort of uh, unwitting carer for a surviving gosling egg, having accidentally been responsible for the destruction of the nest and the death of his family. So she's left to play mum to a, 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 a baby gosling, a gosling chick, and uh, with a fox named Fink who becomes a sort of sidekick and uncle-type figure, and they become an unlikely family unit, tasked with teaching the chick, who comes to be known as Bright Bill, how to, you know, how to eat, swim, and fly in time for the upcoming migration. Have a listen. So what are you going to name them? I assign to you, Gosling, 0001. Okay, that sucked. That sucks. You gotta learn to make stuff up. Come on, find that uh, inside you. Searching. Anything yet? No. Just have a little fun for once. Gosling, zero, one, eight, six. There, you see what I did? His numbering is out of sequence. Do you know, watching the trailer to this, I do love how they've animated Roz. Yes. Like, it, it makes you empathetic straight away. Yeah, Roz is an absolutely incredible, a beautiful creation. The film is gorgeous. The film is absolutely stunning. Um, but it's a, when I, 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 it's a film I can say is a beautiful film in both aesthetics and heart as well. It's a wonderful story. It's, honestly, I laughed as hard as I cried. And, and I did both a lot in it. I've seen this twice now. And I've been blown away both times by it. I genuinely think it's... It, I mean, it's instantly one of my favourite films of the year. It feels like What If the Iron Giant But Fly Away Home with elements of maybe Avatar in the third act. It is gorgeous. It's well well performed. It's got... Um, Bill Nye in this sort of Willem Dafoe in Finding Nemo type mode. I mean, God, the voice cast on this. Lupita Nyong'o in the lead there as Roz. Um, did, could you tell that that was Pedro Pascal, by the way, as Fink the Fox in that clip? No. 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 Nope. Uh, he, he's, he's great here as well. Um, you've got you've got Bill Nye, so automatic extra star for having Bill Nye in there. Agree. You've got that animation style, as I say, that's reminiscent of... Um, the Puss in Boots sequel or The Bad Guys, where the DreamWorks are doing something quite interesting with their animated style. But, um, and this is where it gets fascinating for me. I And I had this thought when I was watching it the second time, which was last night. So I was watching this with Faith, and uh, we, we, we hadn't intended to watch it, we just saw it by chance. And it struck me that one of the most interesting sort of parts of this, this whole, you know, studio as brand era that we currently live in, you know the idea, like, we have, like, Marvel Studios and Pixar and DreamWorks and Illumination and, yeah. you know, like, the studios now are brands themselves in a way that, like, tech companies are. You know, a studio, like, DreamWorks is like Apple in a sense. But the whole interesting thing, one of the more interesting elements of this era um, is, is it's just sort of like how the high watermarks of those brands Often tend to be so much so so much more superior to the sort of flagship brands for them. You know, like how Pixar has Toy Story as its flagship brand. Yeah. In reality, though, its actual high watermarks, I think we can all agree, are things like Wally or Finding Nemo or Monsters Inc. Right. This feels for me in the same way that like you know, DreamWorks is, you know, the house that Shrek built. So Shrek is kind of the flagship DreamWorks brand. Yeah. This is going to be again one of the high watermarks that we talk about for DreamWorks in the same way that we use Wally -E, Finding Nemo and Monsters Inc. for Pixar. Like this is gonna be it. Because I tell you this, for nothing, this genuinely is the best movie DreamWorks has ever made. Wow. That's a statement. Not even kidding. Hands down, effortlessly, this is the best movie DreamWorks ever put out. I think it's fantastic. Not even kidding. 
I just I absolutely fell in love with this film instantly. Its its humor is 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 really funny. Its its sense of humor is genuinely gut bustingly funny. Its emotional beats are strong. Its characterization is really well written. It 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 defines its relationships really well. It plays with so many different themes. It, you know, it, it, in a way that I think is going to make it like an instant classic for kids. In the same way that I can instantly imagine, I can understand how this was a best-selling children's book, just because of the visual style of it. And this is why I thought you must have known it. No. I just imagined you would have. I had never, I've never seen the book, mm. heard of the book, and absolutely knew nothing about this. I mean, uh, you know, it's just not one that Albert's picked up at the library or, or that, you know, we've bought for him to read, I suppose. But, you know, mm. I, I, I'm sold on it. It looks, it looks beautiful. And I'm going to experiment with this with the kids this weekend. Yeah. Um, and we're going to sit down at some point and watch it. And then I can let you know next week what they thought. We shall see that I'm looking forward to that because I genuinely think this is going to be, this is going to be something, this is going to be like one of those staple movies of childhood for decades to come in the in the way that you know you look back on you know certain disney classics that you see at a certain age or or people our age look back bambi at bambi you know, like kind of the way that we still think of bambi and things like that. i genuinely think this is a bigger movie let me put it this way i i will bet folding money here and now that this gets best anime this gets the best animated win at the oscars on march the 2nd next year i will bet folding money here and now that, I, that this wins best animated feature and you you can check back with me in march like remind me but yeah all right i'm gonna make a note of this in my calendar so i'll check with you and see if your your predictions came true um well the wild robot who doesn't want to see that now after that review um it's out in cinemas from today uh right then quick look at next week van what's the biggie well, the biggie next week is uh, the third and supposedly final Venom movie with Tom Hardy. Uh, it's Venom at the Last Dance. And I think it co-stars Chiwetel Ejiofor and uh, Reese Ifans. I think. I mean, I've, I've seen some marketing for it. I know, that, uh, I know that there's a Venom horse in this one. but uh, and, and Null, the creator of the symbiote god or something. I don't know. But I, I, I find these films faintly amusing, but they are trash. I mean, they're sort of trash fun at best. I mean, the, the the first one is like a sort of the first one's like emo version of the mask with like Jim Carrey's mask. This that's like the emo version with Tom Hardy, and yeah. the second one is just <laughs> nonsense. It's just what what is this nonsense? But at least Tom Hardy's having fun. It's that kind of a movie. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what to expect with the third one. I hope I hope it's at least as fun as the last two have been. Well, that's made me quite excited to hear what you have to say about it next week, so we shall see when we return. That is, of course, all we have. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. I I will tell you my favourite ever bit of Venom trivia before we go. Uh, because there's there's post credit sequences on the, on on the first film right and the second film. When I saw it, I was in a cinema screen with your predecessor, uh, the, the the former co presenter of this show, Mr. Case Allen, back in 20, 2018, It was the first Venom, and we noted because we were waiting for the post credits, there are not one but two different people who worked on the movie Venom, whose name is Remington Steele. That is a true story. There you go. <laughs> okay, well, let's see what ha- next week brings once you've seen it, um, and we'll uh, we'll look forward to your review on it. That is, of course, all we have time for this time round, though. Um, we will be back next week. Until then, I've been Adam Ball. I've been Van Connor, and we shall be back. <laughs>